conveys or constructs an idealized view of colonial industry. The plantation house was a shining city upon a hill, bearing all of the biblical self-justification and anti-democratic implications of that phrase. The Casa Caldera, a modern, scientific, rational space of capitalist production. The crisp, detailed view of the boiler room disavows the fire, heat, and grueling, dangerous labor it actually took to run it. The few human figures are isolated and almost relaxed amidst the cooling, functioning machinery. Through their wide circulation and collectability, an enormous inventory of subjects, Maquias educated, informed, and entertained consumers. Cigarette companies and lithography departments featuring state-of-the-art presses and color processes drew widely from graphic sources, including geographic and cartographic series such as El Libro, for content. It was in quotation as a central image on a batilla that we can project the wide dissemination of this and other images taken from El Libro and their subsequent absorption into the visual DNA of the nation. Through the movement that the through improvement from the large explicit volume to tiny wrapping papers, the Ingenio became part of Cuban heritage. Somewhat later in the century, painters invoked the utopian colonialist imagery, depicting, as in the border of the, of the Marquilla, an idyllic, idealized space of abundant natural beauty and docile subjects in harmony with nature and one another. Cuban artists, including Esteban Chardin and his brothers, and European artists like Eduardo Laplante and Frederick Mial, referenced European trans and traditions in landscape painting while extolling the singularity of the island. Many of them subtly reinforced the colonial order through images that consistently presented nature as imminent, a state of potential awaiting European exploitation. The apparently natural and unmediated scenes they depicted follow pre prevalent, if slightly passe by European standards, styles, particularly Romanticism. Throughout the 19th century, these impulses were projected triumphantly as evidence of the natural and God-given bounty of the island. As manifest destiny spread the logic of divine right across the continent in the U.S., so rhetoric of paradise, even notions of the New Jerusalem, underwrote colonial expansion in Cuba. This harmonious sense of natural grace and the harmonious implementation of man's will aligned with God's will wove throughout 19th century landscape painting and the images seen in El Libro. In Chagrin's Paisaje con Vacas, cows roam the the pristine environment, and you can perhaps see in the sort of center of the image cows. They were not native to the island, having been introduced in the 17th century as Cuba's original agribusiness. The small skiff with the solitary fisherman anchors the composition through the human presence. You see on the bottom right, the, this little boat. The beauty of, na of nature is activated by its usefulness. It is perhaps in paintings and lithographs that depict Cuba's unique social landscape that trouble really enters paradise. The societal unrest and contestation that was inherent in the colonial system of conquest and slavery from its inception found its way into paintings and graphics art by the middle of the 19th century. Through scenes depicting people and their activities in the appropriate settings, colonial systems of knowledge projected the classification and the codification of space, place, and and people. The stylistic conventions of postal Grismo created racialized, gendered, and classed subjects that became taken as signifiers of identity. Postal Grismo, concerned with the appearance and activities of people, was a popular literary and visual style in the middle decades of the century throughout Latin America. These observations of race, class, and gender ostensibly reinforced dominant values of white patriarchy but by their sheer repetition reveal the anxiety, brutality, and instability of the colonial system. Colonial anxieties and the failure of their suppression are expressed on stage, in print, and on illustrations, in newspapers, on maquillas, and paintings. Many of these were satiric, always ready to poke fun at oneself, at the high and mighty, and at the lowly. This sense of humor was interpreted as the Cuban tendency not to take things too seriously, to see the funny side of things but it always had an edge, a sharp slap behind the laugh. Ultimately, the satiric mode, known as choteo, became identified 
who became identified as uh, the ex as expressive of the Cuban temperament. It ran through Cuban culture and a Rabelaisian country talk to the rigid yet oddly porous social order that dominated the 19th century. Oops. Frédéric Miale, the French painter, produced some of the most iconic works of 19th century Cuban art, as Emilio discussed, including scenes like this depicting Via de Jays. Faithful to the costumbrista style, he recorded precise details of dress that authenticated his view. The exaggerated gestures of the dancers in that randish costume group looked ridiculous and barbaric to Miali's Creole elite and European viewers and reinforced their sense of superiority. One of the master works of Cuban costumbrista is the volume Hipos y Costumbres de Elisa de Cuba that Carmen mentioned with illustrations by the Basque immigrant Victor Patricio de la Andaluce. In Tipos y Costumbres, la Andaluce illustrated scenes of Cuban life at mid-century mid in Costumbrista style, depicting occupations and activities, the fireman, the country doctor, the midwife, and more. Although la Andaluce was a well-known political loyalist to the crown, is nevertheless considered the foremost observer of Cuban life. While some critics have drawn a line between his political and military activities in the scenes of daily life, the acuity of these scenes, like those of La Plata and Miali, served to reinforce and legitimate the colonial status quo, thus embedding the colonial worldview within the incipient nation. Mulati del Rumbo stands out among the tipos in Tipos y Costumbres for several reasons. Identified as a mulata on her way, she is alone on a bare street, not engaged in any activity. In full body, three-quarter profile, she smiles pettishly at an unseen admirer. It is almost a portrait, except that she is identified only by type and not by name. Molaca de Rumbo is an iconic image reproduced and quoted extensively since its publication, but rarely has it been analyzed as a symptom of the persistence of colonial relations of knowledge when it was ostensibly, but not actually, overcome by the revolution. Beyond La Nalusa's iconic figure, the Molata was a privileged size of national invention in the most renowned novel of the 19th century, Cecilia Valdez, and countless songs and poems. The desirable but ultimately tragic figure is featured on several Magia series, including Historia de la Mulata. Reminiscent of Hogarth's Harlot's Progress, the series illustrates the rise and fall of a beautiful mulata. In this scene, the young mulata, bracketed by her Spanish storekeeper father on the left and her African mother in the far right side, is seduced by two ne'er-do-well white suitors, thus inaugurating her, tra her tragic trajectory. Before independence was won in 1899, history painting, or more broadly, the representation of historical events, was one of the most underdeveloped of art genres in Cuba. I pushed the boundary of colonial art forward into the early days of the Republican era with Armando García Menocas, La Muerte de Maceo, from 1908. Although his romantic style was, and, um, was academic and outmoded, his revolutionary politics were impeccable. Known as the Mambi painter for his participation in the War of Independence and advocacy, and his many, many canvases depicting scenes from the war. Menocal enjoyed a long and successful career as an academic painter and teacher. His conservative style was out of step with the modern Maguandistas dominating the Cuban art scene in the early Republic, but quite popular with bourgeois audiences and patrons. Here, Menocal presents a romanticized view of Maceo's death, framed as a tragic event in the manner of religious painting. The colonial past was of little interest to subsequent Cuban artists until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union, when global events converged to exert a seismic impact on Cuba. The onset of the so-called social special period unmoored Cuban society from its dubious complacency, bringing intellectuals and artists in the direst possible way to research, re-examine, interrogate pre- and post-revolutionary Cuban history to critical and interrogatory ends. 
At this time, young Cuban artists dubbed Mala Yerba by art critics Gerardo Mosquera for their resilience and adaptability often made reference to the visual and material codes of the colony as a way to reference contemporary conditions. They did so, did so through unpacking, appropriating, and reinscribing key scenes and icons of Cuban national identity. Increased exposure to the art world beyond the island introduced artists to the posts, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, and post-modernism, which they implemented in artwork that displayed an acute awareness of the political and, and economic reality of Cuba and its historical art. I will wrap up by briefly discussing six iconic artworks by Cuban artists who deploy colonial styles, themes, and quotations of the work from the 1990s to the present that questions history, ideology, and society. The, um, the work of Santa Ramos explores ideas of gender, geography, and identity through the deployment of both the map and an avatar for Cuban Alice in Wonderland in the dress of a pionera who is both witness and voluntary, involuntary participant in the historical process. Ramos' substitution of a sleeping woman through the map of the island is a point of reference to the colonial and Spanish linguistic association between land and the female body, passivity, conquest, and domination, privileged site for feminist and post-colonial critique. The island woman floats in an undefined sea. Revisiting the ingenios of the Valley of the Moody 150 years after the Libro de los Ingenios was published, the art collective Atelier Morales photographed the sites of the formerly triumphant sugar mills in their present dilapidated and forlorn state. Recently, artists and filmmakers have begun to unpack the complicated history of sugar in Cuba, moving beyond representations of the barbaric plantation of the colonial period, the capitalist machine of the republic, and the phantasmagoric failure of the revolution to the slow-mo decomposition of the present. After 50 years of neglect it was exacerbated by the widespread shortages of the special period and Havana crumbled around and on top of its citizens, Carlos Garaypao photographed decrepit buildings around Havana and restored them with colorful overdrawings that brought attention to their present reality and the gap between this reality and the always deferred ideal. Garaypao's imaginary infrastructure perfectly captures the zeitgeist of the special period chronicled in fictions, essays, and poetry written in the 1990s by Antonio Jose Ponte. Referencing Marquia's punching humor, the art collective Los Carpinteros played with the proverbs, jokes, and puns of Choteo and the popular visual form of the Marquia, flipping the Marquia's externalized European objects for self-portraits, race and gender as seen from within. Los Carpinteros, as befitting their name, reintroduced traditional artisanal woodworking and craftsmanship to fine art, taking their initial social practice of repairing furniture into their fine art production. In one from the series The Romantic Dollarscape, Alvarez juxtaposes iconic images from Cuban and hemispheric popular visual culture in a pile-up of signs, to paraphrase Tyler Stallings, including the Mulata de Rumbo and other victims of colonialism, among symbols for, of the U.S. $1 bill, anathema of the revolution reintroduced into the Cuban economy during the special period. Alvarez's image critiques of green and fertile neocolonialism, a system that remained latent during the revolution, erupting in full carnivalesque grotesquery in the post-fall New World Order. And I conclude with this photograph taken last month at the opening of an exhibition by the young Cuban artist Jose Manuel Mesías at Factoria Havana. The exhibition is up until October, and I highly recommend seeing it if you're going to Havana before October. Um, in this work, which is part of an installation comprised of paintings, sketches, sculpture, photographs, and objects, the artist set out, sets out to correct the errors in Menocal's painting of the death of Maceo through his invented archive of historical data and objects. 
and I only had a very small file of the painting that you can see it in the exhibit in the exhibition you know, the larger <coughs> slide. The works in the exhibition flaunt the fictitiousness of the historical record. Messias's historical revision is an ambitious reconsideration of the foundational fiction of colonial art. Thank you. just to recognize Professor Juan Martinez, who is here in the corner. So wonderful to see you back, Professor Martinez. We'll be Thank celebrating you. you all day, Thank so you'll have to stick around it. and join the party. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll open it up for questions. If I can ask you to please um, stand uh, let us know your name and state your question. Uh, and we don't have a microphone, so we'll have to ask you to, to I'm sorry, to speak up. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is Maria. Emilio Cueto. My name is Jim Slide. Real quick, the one that said Panadero. How would you really interest me? I'm sorry. Picture Panadero. Yeah. I don't know if it showed. Was there bread being made? No, I'm sorry. It's the bread seller. The bread seller. He, he's parading through Havana with his particular um, contraption to, where the bread was distributed. And the, the name on, the, um, on that uh, basket says Panaveria. It's the bread, it's the bread <coughs> seller. And he, it's in the, in the same composition as someone who's saying selling fodder for the animals to eat. So it's a street scene of Havana, putting two of the, of the criers of, of Havana selling their stuff. So we have Cuban bread back then. We have Cuban bread back then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Um, Hello, I'm Chiti Morales, and this is another question for me and you. <laughs> you said that the pr Cuban prints were not printed in Spain. Was that the same for all the colonies? No, I, I'm sorry. Let I, me just, sorry, let me just repeat the question. So she was asking, um, Emilio made the comment that Cuban prints were not printed in Spain. Was that the case for all the colonies? Well, first let me, let me say, I took 15 projects um, that were Purposeful, self-contained. Other individual prints were printed that were not part of a project uh, in periodicals, and there were some prints printed in Spain. So let me get that out of the way. The 50 projects I used, none of them, but there were part, some prints in Spain. There was one important print um, depicting the arrival of the remains of Christopher Columbus from uh, the Dominican Republic. Cuba, printed in Spain, and there were a few other um, images printed in Spain. Um, but I don't know about other colonies because I really, <coughs> what I study and collect are Cuban prints, so I, I cannot give you. Spain had um, made a lot of printing done, but not much about Cuba, I have to say. The first prints I remember of Spain were three little images appearing in a travel book that depict a man a woman and a slave. Um, I think that's the beginning of the Spanish interest in Cuba. So there's a few throughout the, uh, the, the history of Spain that you can trace. But in the major projects, I mean, you had Frenchmen and German coming to Cuba and do work and going back to the countries and printing the images. We don't have any such equivalent in Spain, uh, in Spanish. Art. I just want to thank you guys. It's not uh, often that one can see a program on colonial Cuban art. Even though there's such a wealth <coughs> of art, not much time is dedicated to it, or publications or anything like that. So it's just quite wonderful. Sorry, Amelia, I, I miss yours. I had to get out of the house. But I really enjoyed both of yours. And, um, and, and Carmen, um, I really appreciate seeing 
an image by say lambda loose in this case that is analyzed in depth because a lot of the time things are just pass over, pass over. But to look at every part of it and try to put it in some sort of context, I think we definitely would need more of that on colonial art. And one last thing I'd like to say is that I uh, I receive a lot of catalogs from university <coughs> presses, and I want to open one one day that says. E. Carmen Ramos, Landa Lucen book. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yes, another question here? Hi, Mike. Um, going back to Dr. Ramos, I found it intriguing how you were uh, selecting that particular painting and, and dissecting it for us. You know, things that we really do not pay attention to unless you become a scholar, of course, like you are. Is, is this the only uh, painter that you have been doing this with, or are you going through different periods of the colonial time and different painters and what they were actually saying uh, through the painting and the history that <coughs> they related to? Yes. Um, do you want to go there, or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this project comes from this project comes from my dissertation, um, and which really focused on Lama Lusa, uh, but it does put him in the context of 19th century Cuban, Cuban life and culture. And uh, so within that context, in a comparative way, I do engage the work of other artists um, that were working either before he arrived or during the time that he was uh, working, uh, in part because I'm, I became really interested in Understanding uh, understanding the political nature of his work, but also the, the racial politics of his work, you know, and the importance of race in 19th century Cuban uh, society is a paramount importance. Uh, so there are other there are other artists, there are the Matias y Herreras, there are all these kind of manifestations of, of visual culture uh, that really kind of create this this much larger uh, context um, and and. You know, and I was a little concerned about presenting this kind of deep dive into one painting. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe this is too much for people. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think that's what we need to do. You know, that's what we need to do to, you know, to, to really present him as an artist. And this is what artists do, right? They construct their paintings or compositions. They they put things in certain places for strategic reasons. You know, and we really need to to kind of you know understand that understand it within the historical context in which it was born. And one of the challenges with Lando Luce is that his work is so iconic um, and so much of his painting is undated that it leads to his work becoming this, what I like to call this free-floating signifier, right? It kind of could mean anything, it's like the 19th century. And I'm like, no, right? His work was very grounded, you know? And in my, in my work, I try to find ways to ground his work historically. Uh, those works that are dated and even the ones that are undated. I found it extremely interesting. Thank you so much. Any other questions? And to the panelists, any questions for one another? We have about four minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question. Hi, uh, Victor Duby, University of Miami. Uh, the, um, Prince of uh, 1762 in Havana. I'm, I'm interested in this uh, Franco-English artist Dominic Serres who created that whole series of oils, which I gather are taken from the prints from the time. And I'm wondering if there was uh, further examples of artists painting views of Cuba based on the prints that were circulating that you've researched. I'm not familiar with that period. Would like to move on. Before I'll, I'll, I'll address the Sarah's paintings. For some reasons that escaped me, the actual artist on the prints was really not so much Sarah's, but another fellow who seems doesn't get any credit, which was Philip Portsbridge. Even though his name appears on all the prints, no one ever mentions the poor guy. So the guy who painted, who, who did the actual images, um, or some, or someone that was called Orsbridge, and then Sarah's painted the, the uh, did the one did the, did the engravings, and then there were the, the oil paintings, as you know, who 
were in Greenwich uh, at some point and recently were sold because they were on loan to the Greenwich and it was sold in Christie's in London last year. Um, I am not sure of which came first, whether the oils came first and then the painting, or the paintings came, for, came, for, came later. I'm not totally sure. I, I know one more, one additional case, which is the Guinea, the Guinea, um, or Guinea, I think, because it has a, it has a crema, um, sugar mill. In Havana's National Library, there's a, an oil painting of the Guinea sugar mill that ends up being one of the one of the um, prints in Los Ingenios. So that's one certain case I know of that you have an oil painting and then also a, um, a, an image. Of course, all prints started with some sort of, of, of drawing before they ended up being prints. The problem is that in most cases we have lost them. I do know that the ingenious original drawings survived because I was lucky enough to see them in one collection, one private collection. But you can see, if you look at the original drawing and the, and the uh, eventual print, the, there was a lot, of, a lot of work going into the printing from the original drawing. But the only one I remember is the Guinea Ingenio. I, I have to think further and see if there's any other, any other of those, um, of those um, connections. Let me think about it. Thank you. Okay, and so with that, um, I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. <laughs>